on. Can you hear me? All right. Well, it is good to be here. Thanks, Pastor Jeff. It has been a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun at family camp. I don't know if you know this, but God was actually in the mountains. So you guys were in the valley, and God showed up in the mountains. So I'm so sorry that you guys had to stay here because he really was up there last night, if you're wondering where he was. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I am Deborah. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen Havila speak before. How many of you? Okay. Yes, you are seeing an identical twin. And so I do tell her all the time, you need to be nice to me because one photo on social media could change your entire ministry. So I say, be kind. I have the power in my hands to ruin your life. So she's very kind to me and, and makes sure that I'm happy at all times for that reason. I will tell you, my husband is in the front row. Dan, you want to stand? And my kids, William, Wesley, and Gabriella. <laughs> When we were, I think about six months ago, visiting Havila and Ben, her husband, up in Reading and saying hello, um, one of the neighbors who had been there, they've lived there a couple years now, thought that Havila, um, that another man was visiting Havila and spending time with her. And when I came and introduced myself, she said, that was really odd. I, I saw this other man you were getting in the car with. I thought it was Havila. And I kept thinking, who does she think Havila is? <laughs> like, Havila's a minister. She knows she preaches. She knows all that. But we do definitely, um, you know, we, we get mixed up. In fact, I was telling uh, the camp that we have, our husbands have sometimes mixed us up as well. And, yes, and one time I was, my husband does not work in the church, but Ben does. And so we were in the church, and I had just gone on the phone with my husband. I knew he was not at the church building. And then I walked past one of the rooms, and I saw my dad, and he was uh, talking. So I knew they were both, you know, gone. And so I walked into the hallway, and I started to talk to a pastor. And as I was doing that, I felt somebody come around and reach around my waist, which you know, as a, as a woman, after you have children, this is like a no-no touching zone, right, for any men. Like, you don't touch this area. And so I felt someone reach around and grab me, and I, at that split second, knew, okay, my husband's at work, my dad's in the other room, who is this? And before I could even uh, think, he pulled me into him, and he said, hi, honey. And as I looked up, there was my brother-in-law looking at me, <laughs> and he panicked, and he chucked me. He, like, <laughs> threw me to the other side, and the pastor who was there said, I, it was really weird. I thought I was talking to Deborah, but then I saw Ben come up and hug you. And then I thought, is that Havila? And then, so it was very, very embarrassing. And um, my, <laughs> what's funny is Ben is a little bit more conservative than my husband. My husband probably would have rolled with it and, and teased, but Ben was not happy. He was very embarrassed about the whole situation. So I can finally talk about it uh, as it's taken a little while for him. But if you want to turn, <laughs> turn in your Bibles to Exodus 14, we're going to dive into it. Um, Exodus, and I do have it on the screen as well if you, if you need to see it there. But Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you. It's one of my favorite verses. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. Today I want to talk to you about the plans of God for you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you that you're already speaking. Lord, even in worship, you have given me words to speak to people, Lord, and I know that you are going to do amazing things. I pray that you would open the hearts of your people to hear. I know that summertime can be a time of relaxation, but Lord, they're here. They're, they're wanting to dive into what you have for them. And so I thank you for that. I pray that this would be fertile soil that you would speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, I want to talk to you about trusting in the transition. How many of you love transition? Like you love new things and you love movement. How many love, love to move a house? You guys like, okay. My husband and I have moved 11 times in, 11, in 12 years. So we do know how to move very, very well. We know how to break things. We know how to damage things. We know um, all of that. And we, I hate transition. Like, I will be honest, I am not one of these. I like new things, but I don't like that period of time when you have to adjust to something new. Uh, about 14 years ago, I had said this up at camp, so if you weren't there, I'm sorry, you've missed the story with it. You'll have to uh, listen later. But about 14 years ago, I felt a call to go to England. And I had always felt a call, even since a child, uh, to be and go to England. I had a fascination. I would write uh, books or um, book reports about England. And so just as a child, if you have a heart for something, you never know what God has for you. But I always had a longing and a heart, and through a series of events, 
um, I was able to go to England. And what I didn't realize at the time in going to England is I thought that England was America just with accents, right? Like, like they were just like us. They just have accents. That's, that's the only difference. And so um, I remember getting on a plane to go to England. I was joining a ministry there. I did not know a soul. I did not know anybody when I got to England. In fact, I walked off the plane and looked for somebody to say, to say hi to me because I didn't know who they were. I got there. Um, I moved into a new house with a bunch of people I did not know and just began to adjust to a new season. I was 25 years old. I was in England for the first time. And so being American, kind of the way we are, we just figure, like, solve problems, right? Like, if we need to have issues, we make phone calls, we figure it out. So I thought, you know what? Uh, they said, you're, when you arrive, you're not going to need a car. Like, we, n most young people do not have cars in England. You're not going to need a car. And I said, great. They said, you can walk to the church and, and do your thing and walk back. Well, the first day I got there, I went to walk to the church, and it was a 45-minute walk there. And a 45-minute walk home. And I thought, okay, this isn't going to work. We're Americans. <laughs> we don't walk, right? <laughs> like, we walk. We pay to walk in gyms, but we don't walk, right? So, and I thought, I'm going to lose weight. Like, I can't do that. So I thought, I've got to get a car. Like, there's, I've got to get a car because we, we have transportation. So I went online. I looked. It was, I think it was even before, you know, anything out there. They had no Craigslist. They had nothing that was familiar in transition that I would normally go to. I had no uncle to call to ask, you know, what kind of car should I get? I didn't know anybody in the church. So I just went online and randomly looked for a car. So I found a car that was in my price range, and it was like a tiny little mini. Now, the minis you see on the road today are SUV size compared to the mini that I had. My mini fit literally on this platform right here. That's how big my little car was. So I decided I was going to go down, I was going to buy the car, and I was going to bring it home and have a car while I was in England. So I get on the, the train, you know, get off at the right place, and I, um, get, you know, decide to go buy this car to knock on the door. Well, what you don't know about me, and I have realized this as time has gone on, I, have you ever seen the movie Pure Luck, where your life just doesn't work out very well for you? That is my life. I did not know I had that problem. I thought everyone's life didn't work out very well. I thought everyone, you got a, a box of something new and you, it would come broken or with no instructions or your car broke down at least three times a year. Like I thought these things were very normal until I met Daniel and his life, everything worked out for him. And I went, something's very unique about my life. So I, um, so just, I want to give you a preference to the story as to what happened. So I knock on the door to this man's house, and I say, I'm here to buy your car. And he says, great, do you have insurance? And I said, well, no, I, I have to wait to buy the car. I'll buy insurance. Well, in England, the car is not insured. You are insured as a person. So he says, well, you can't test drive my car. You have no insurance. So I've now been on a train for two hours to pick up this car. I've got cash in my hand, and I can't buy the car. So I kind of sit there. I don't really know what to do at the moment. And he says, how about I'll test drive the car, and you can sit in the front, and I'll tell you how it drives. <laughs> Well, I'm stuck, right? I'm in transition. I don't want no, I have no other option. So I say, that's a great idea. So I get in the car, he gets in, and he takes me around the roundabouts and drives, and he says, it's great, you know, the brakes are great, everything's great. And I believe him, because that's all I can do at that moment. And so at the end, I said, great, you know, I'll, I'll buy your car. So I should have known at that moment when um, we went to start the car again, and it didn't start, that it, and it was dead, that I probably shouldn't have bought the car. But I just thought, this is my life. Like, this is very normal. So he got the jumper cables out, jumped the car. I got in the car, got on my way, went the wrong way around the roundabout, and off I went on my way with my new car. So this car became like the thorn in my flesh. This car, you could not tell. I don't know how many of you have had a bad car in your life. Um, they, you could not tell the gas gauge, so you never knew when you were going to run out of gas. So I ran out of gas multiple times. Um, there was a moment with the car when I was supposed to take one of the girls who was living near us to the airport for Christmas to go to Denmark to, to be with her family for Christmas. I woke up at 4 in the morning to take her. My car would not start. We pushed the car to the point where she missed her flight and missed Christmas in Denmark with her family. That's how bad my car was. My car was so bad. Uh, in England, they also, you know how we have AAA, so if our car breaks down, they take the car and they tow it to a shop, right? And then you, they fix the car. 
Well, in England, the car, the mechanic comes to you, and they work on the car on the side of the road for hours. So I would spend hours and hours sitting on the sides of roads in England waiting for my car to be fixed as the mechanic sat there and tried to work on it. Um, we, one time I uh, thought my car had been stolen because it was so small. So I uh, w- looked down the street. I, I saw that there was no car. I, of course, we're American. We do the first thing. I made a police report, called in, said my car had been stolen. The church could not believe it. The car had been stolen. They began to pray for me. They did a whole prayer chain. Um, I was signed up for victims, crimes against victims um, in a little thing. About four days later, my soon-to-be husband was walking down the street and found my car parked between two other cars, but it was so small I could not see it. So um, I did announce to the church that the Lord had found my car, <laughs> right? And God was good, and he, he made a miraculous thing happen. And uh, we, they, don't know, they don't know what really happened. Um, in the middle of transition, transition's tough. You don't always realize, you think something's going to be easy, and then it just, it doesn't work out the, the way you think. Uh, when I went to meet my husband Daniel, his family for the first time, at the time we were dating, um, we were not engaged or anything, we took the car, we called, the car was named uh, Roxy, and um, we took Roxy, drove about an hour and a half to Cambridge to visit his family, of course the car broke down halfway to Cambridge, and so his mother, my future mother-in-law, who I was meeting for the first time, picked us up, brought us back to the house, and I had to, because it was raining, change into her clothes to meet her. So I met my mother-in-law for the first time in her clothes. And um, so it was, a, it was a, a really hard transitional experience for me. And I, what I didn't realize is sometimes in transition, we think it's going to be easy. Like we've mapped it out, it's going to be easy, and then things begin to hit us. And we're like, wow, it was really easy, and now it's really tough. It's really hard. And we don't like transition. And it was a really, really hard season for me. The time between the promise and the fulfillment is the transition. And usually in the Bible, it's called the wilderness season, right? It's when you leave, you know, darkness and all of that, and you're waiting to go into your promised land, and there's a season of transition or a wilderness. How many of you have been in transition? In Exodus, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. God told them it's time to believe for a new land, a promised land. But how were they going to get out of slavery? And many of us know the story. God had a plan, right? He brings Moses. Moses leads them out. 1.5 million people into the wilderness out of slavery. He opens up the Red Sea for them. God, you know, parts the Red Sea. He provides water for them. He provides manna from heaven. He provides a cloud by day and fire by night. And he has all these things that are miracles that are happening. And a lot of times when we leave something that we um, are are be getting free from, there's miracles that happen in our life. God provides, just like getting to England. God, there were huge miracles that happened to get me to England. But when I got to England, I had to go through a season of transition. And it was not easy. There were things that I had to adjust to. And in the same way with the Israelites, they're stuck in the wilderness. And what should have taken 11 days took them 40 years. And my question to you is, What is taking you, that should be taking you 11 days in your life, is taking you 40 years to get into your promised land? Exodus 14.3 says, Pharaoh will say of the Israelites, they are wandering around in the land in confusion. The wilderness has boxed them in. After Daniel and I... Um, you know, I came back from England, he came back, proposed, we got married, and there was a season where he was working shift work, how many of you guys work shift work, nights and weekends, and all that fun stuff, and he was working um, in that way, and I, because I was raised, my parents were, my dad was actually a traveling minister for 18 years, so we traveled, we did this, we would travel, he would speak, and so we lived off of people's love offerings a lot, people would provide income, and, and that's how we lived, so Growing up, there were certain vows I made in my heart. I did not realize I had the vows until um, I grew up. But there were vows like I will never live by like faith. Like I will always have a paycheck. I will always have health care. I will always have. There were certain things I just had um, in my heart. And so we got married. And, you know, obviously he's got a, a job and everything's fine. And we're having babies. We had three, three babies in three years. And life was crazy. But when I was pregnant with our third son, Wesley, um, Wesley 
praise God. I got a text last night during worship, uh, a call from the manager of Barnes & Noble that he was lost and that someone had left him there. So uh, I called my husband, and he had to go back and pick Wesley up at Barnes & Noble last night. (laughs) I just want to throw my husband under the bus right now on that one. Anyways, so Wesley's been lost about three big times in Disneyland once, Macy's, San Francisco downtown, and then uh, now this. So he's the third born, guys. It comes with the territory. That's just who he is. So what, So I'm pregnant with Wesley, and my husband comes to me, and he says, there's a man in the church who um, runs a car dealership, and he wants me to come work for him. And um, it's going to be awesome, and the thing is, is that it's 100% commission right? And all of a sudden, my warning lights come up. Like, what do you mean 100% commission? He's like, well, you know, I have to sell, and if I sell cars, then I make money. If I don't, I don't. I am now eight months pregnant with our third baby, and I look at him, and I am trying to stall him, right? So I say, well, can we just wait? Can we at least have health care until I'm done with my baby, having our baby? And, and then maybe, you know, we'll pray about it. And inside I'm thinking he's going to forget about it, right? He's going to forget about it. He's going to, like, become sane again. And he's going to think about a paycheck and providing for his family. And everything's going to be fine. So I, you know, do have my baby and, or our baby. And I'm, I'm there in the hospital. And two days into the hospital, he walks in and he says, well, I've given my notice, two weeks, I'm going on full-time commission, right? And I'm sitting there with my baby and like, oh my goodness, dear Lord, help us. And so, um, so he says to me, I think the best thing that can happen is, is if, if I'm going to do this, I think it'd be good for us to move in with your parents because if I don't make any money, then at least we have a place to live, Right. I'm 33 years old, I have three children under three, and, and he's like, we're going to move with your parents. So I'm like, okay, so we move with my parents, and how many of you are, have ever been in sales where it takes a little while to get going, right? Like, you don't just get a paycheck the first month, you have to, like, sow seed and sow seed, and then you begin to, you know, fruit happens, but it takes some time. So months start to go by, and there is, he's just starting to learn how to sell. And so it is bare bones. It is, we literally have nothing. And so uh, there was a point when I was really struggling. I didn't know what to do. Um, I had a medical thing. I didn't have money to go to the doctor. I didn't have money. They, um, I had a a doctor in our church who prescribed medication for me, but because I didn't have health insurance, it was like $250 and I didn't have that kind of money to even pay for the medication. So I was stuck like that. And then um, there was a system that we could do. I don't know if you've heard of it with where you can mothers infants and kids to get bread and milk and all that stuff and so I thought well at least I'll get that and you know God provide that for me so I don't have to pay for those supplies and so I remember sitting in I had my my little infant I was sick I didn't have the med- the money for the medication I had um, all the kids packed in my car and I remember sitting in the wick parking lot and this was six years ago and I remember being mad at God like God why did you you've left me in this wilderness. Like, I have been in transition. I've been waiting for your hand, you know, to, to do and provide. I have been obedient to my husband. I've been obedient to what he wants to do. And yet, what I feel like my life doesn't look anything like I thought it was going to look. I served you all the days of my life. I've never fallen away. I've given. I've tithed. I've served in the church. And now I'm sitting in this car, barely having food to pay for our, our kids, for, you know, whatever it was. No money for our medication. I'm sitting here, and I just was mad. I was... I was angry at the, at the Lord, and I was frustrated. I remember thinking, Lord, what have you done? Like, you've left me in this wilderness. Like, yes, you have provided many, many times for me. But isn't it funny how quickly we forget? Like, how quickly we go right back into, God, you forgot about me. You don't remember me. And so I remember sitting in that car and feeling really, really overwhelmed. And I remember the Lord saying to me, you know, Deborah, I've got to write your story. You know, your parents have their own faith walk, right? They've had to pray and see God move miraculously. But I have to write your story. And you're going to have to go through your own struggles and your own wilderness and your own seasons to believe me for the things to come. And you cannot live off your parents' faith. You can't live off your pastor's faith. You can't even live off the, you know, the great books that you read of their faith. I have to create your own faith in what I have to do for you. And so I'm building your story. So I remember praying, and I, I went home to Daniel, and I said, you know, honey, 
Um, you know, I was one of these where I'm a bit of a problem solver. I like to solve problems. So there was a, a long season when I would make decisions for us to do certain things, and he would go along with it because he was kind of new to the country and didn't really know. And so I'd kind of get us in trouble because I'd make quick decisions. And so I remember coming home to him and saying, you know what, honey, I'm going to trust you. Like, I've done all I can do. I have tried every angle I can to do it my way. I'm going to submit to you. I'm going to submit to what you feel like the Lord wants to happen in our life. And for the first time, I let go of the reins of control. And it really was the anxiety, the fear, the unbelief of, of trusting this man that he could lead us in what we need to do. And so I said, you know, honey, I'm going to trust you in this process. And so he went to work. And over that first year, he won salesman of the year. He, he, uh, he made, it, our, our income began to double, then triple, then quadruple. He went for in three years from being a salesman to running the entire store. And now this year he ran uh, dealership of the year in the entire country. And so it's amazing how, it's not amazing that the, that how God did that. But what happened in that process of transition was I had to release control of the transition to allow God to do what he needed to do. I did not know what it would look like at this part of my story. I only saw what it was like sitting in that car in the Wick parking lot mad at God. And God has to build our story. And we don't always know or understand what it looks like. And we don't always want him to write our story. <laughs> like, we feel like we're pretty good authors. Like, let me, you know, God, let me just give you this script. And if you could just follow this script and I'll, you know, I'll edit through it, tell you what I want. And you just kind of sign the dotted lines. We're good to go. And God's like, mm -mm. nope, that's not how I want your story to be. I've got my own story for you. God is creating your story. Most of the time, our stories come in the valleys. They come in the wildernesses. We are not made for the mountaintops. Although I love the mountaintop experiences, the reality is most of our story is made in the wilderness. And a wilderness is a time of testing. Exodus 14.3, Pharaoh will say of the Israelites, they are wandering around in a land in confusion. The wilderness has boxed them in. In the Hebrews, get this, the definition for wandering, it actually is the word nude in the um, Hebrew, but it means to waver, to wander, to flee, to despair. How many of you felt despair in your wilderness? How many of you have wanted to, to run, right? Get me out of here. I'm done. I, I cashed in my parent card. I cashed in my adult card. I'm out. I'm done. It means to take pity. How many of you have ever felt sorry for yourself? Absolutely. Like I probably would, I went gold medal in feeling sorry for myself, right? But you know what the other meaning is? It means to skip for joy. Wandering in the Bible means to skip for joy. So you have a choice in how you want to wander. You can have pity. You can feel sorry for yourself. You can feel frustrated. You can feel despair. You can want to run or you can skip for joy. And you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of when we were in this difficult time financially, trying to figure out our lives. My daughter was not one of these who would stand over me at night in bed and go, Mom, did you pay the rent, right? She had no fear. She didn't go, Mom, when we get to the grocery store, do we have money for, for food? She was not thinking that at all. And I think a lot of times the Lord wants us to react like that we, as children, to say, you know what, Lord, I trust you, and I'm not going to worry. There's no fear in what you're going to do. You are a good father, and you do give good gifts to your children. So we have a choice. Are you going to believe what God has spoken over you? That's right. Amen. <laughs> There's a faith of a child right there, guys. You know what? We got we to gotta wipe off the history. Like when, when, when I began to believe God for my life and what he had for me, the reason I believed is because I had, I, I, I had a childlike faith. And as we get older, you know, I'll be 40 in a couple months. As we get older, we get really skeptical. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, we've seen it all. We've done it all. Yeah. And we don't have that childlike faith to say, no, God, I'm going to believe in what you have for me. Listen, the setback was never meant to defeat you. It was meant to promote you. I'm going to say that again. The setback was never meant to defeat you. It was meant to promote you. And so when you look at your life and you look at maybe the transitions that you had, that God was about to promote you. He's about to do something new and fresh in your life that you can believe for. 
So what would I have told Deborah sitting in that car in the Wick parking lot now? Like what would I have told her as, I, as she sat there wondering, God, are you going to leave me here, you know, and feeling so um, really discouraged and feeling like God had abandoned? What would I have said to her? This is the first thing I would have told Deborah. Stop fantasizing about the past. We fantasize about our, what our life could have looked like. Our confidence in the goodness of God starts to be questioned. And we look at things God did in our lives in the past and we begin to glorify them. Do you know that when you look at things in the past, you have rose-colored glasses on? Do you know that when we talk about the good old days and how awesome the good old days were, we don't really remember the struggle that we had in the middle of the good old days? It's like I have, I have women, older women all the time say to me, oh my gosh, enjoy this time with your babies. Like enjoy it. You will never get this again. And then I look at them and think, you sleep through the night, right? Like, <laughs> like, you're, like you're, you're, your perception of, of having children is you having a good night's sleep and getting in the car by yourself and buckling nobody in and walking the grocery store. And like there's a, you forget the struggle of having to parent and life and craziness. And so you can look now and go, oh my gosh, it was the best of my life. And I do that. But the reality is, is there's a struggle with it. There was heartache with it. There's pain with it. It's never as beautiful as it looked like in your mind. And so we can look back and go, how come I didn't make that decision? It looks so clear now. We don't remember what it was like at the time and what all the things we were battling and going through. We forget the pain, the anxiety, the fear, and all the things we had to overcome to get to this place. In Exodus 16.3, the Israelites said in the wilderness, If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. They, <laughs> there we sat with pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. Okay, wait, remember, guys, they were in slavery. They worked seven days a week. They had no hay to make brick. Like, this was their life. And yet, isn't it funny how rose-colored glasses they were about their life, right? They, we sat with pots filled with meat. We ate all the bread we wanted. But now you brought us in this wilderness to starve us to death. Is that truth? No. But, man, did they believe it. And how many of you in your life, man, if I only had this, if it only looked like this, if I remember when I had this position, I remember when I had this opportunity, it's rose-colored glasses, guys. It's not real. And we have to look at our life the way that God had it and how he, what he's done in our life. The second thing I would have told Deborah sitting in that car is stop comparing your journey and process to somebody else's. Listen. If anybody wants to compare their life, I can compare my life, guys. Havel is my sister, identical twin sister. And that is a joy, and it is a wonderful thing, and we are best friends, and we have a wonderful life together. But the reality is there was a season when I had to believe that God had my own assignment. And if I didn't believe that, I could sit in the shadow and go, well, everyone's going to think every time I get up and speak, oh, is it not her? Oh, she's, but she would have said it better. Oh, she would have done that better. Oh, she was funnier. Oh, I could live in that, but I had to come to a place of saying, you know what, I don't care what anybody else does. I'm going to do the assignment that's on my life to do, and I have people that I'm going to reach that she's not going to be able to reach. And in the same way, don't look around at other people's assignments. They're, that is not on your plate. Get back in your yard and look what God has to do in your life and who you have to influence in your life. Stop getting in other people's yards. Because you don't have the anointing on your life to do what they're called to do. And even if you did it, you wouldn't be happy. Because if you have a spirit of comparing, you're going to compare no matter what you do. You know what I mean? It's like it's that, that beautiful keeping up with the Joneses. Well, I got the new car. Oh, my gosh, he got the new car. I got the best car. And then, oh, my goodness, my, you know, it's just, it's, you never win. It's, you'll never be satisfied. Havel says it so well. She says it here about comparison. Comparison is the enemy's way of telling you God cheated you. Let me just tell you, the enemy is very generic. He says the same thing to all of us. Have you ever heard that? Oh, God cheated you. If you were only raised in this family, if you only had this spouse, if you only had these kids, if you only had, oh, you've been cheated. It's the same lie, guys. It's the same lie. We all have it. 
but God wants us to step out and do what he's asked to do. What else would I would have told Deborah as she was sitting in that car? Don't let shame stop you from learning something new. Shame, the belief that I should know better. Do you realize that when I sat in that car, there was shame involved with failure? Like there was shame where I felt like everybody was watching my life and they were comparing me to my life, to Havilah's, to people around me and thinking, there must be sin in her life. Like there must be something she's doing because her life is not turning out like this other person's. And so I would walk in shame. I remember coming to church and people thinking like, what's going on? Like why is she, you know, what's going on with her life? Like she was doing full-time ministry and now she's, her husband's working full-time and she's home with the kids. And is she, you know, is something wrong? And here I am in my wilderness season and I have shame. And it was not meant to be shame. Shame is for sin, guys. And we have shame. We put shame on ourselves, and it was never meant. Guilt and shame was for sin. You're not in sin if you make a choice and you head into a wilderness season. You're not in sin. God has put you and led you into that wilderness season. But a lot of times we begin to feel shame, and then we feel like we can't do anything new because we're kind of stuck in this place. The Israelites had to become different people to enter their promised land. And you have to become a different person The Lord was building my story. I'm a different person than I was six years ago or ten years ago. And you know what? When people say they're having a hard time financially, I can relate. My heart goes out to them. I understand. I don't judge them. I don't think, well, did you did you budget well? You know, did you did you pick the right job? I don't do any of that anymore. Did I used to in the past? Absolutely. I absolutely would first is judgment. Well, what are you doing wrong? Are you tithing? You know, but guys, listen, when you go through hardship, there's a compassion that comes over you. And you go, you know what? Yeah, I get it. I don't know why you're in a wilderness season. But I'm here to hold hands with you and walk you through this process. And God's going to help you and provide for you in this season. And so whatever you're walking through, whatever wilderness you're in, you are becoming the person God wants you to be to reach the people on the other side. Whatever that looks like. Sometimes our transition is public. Man, I wish it was private. I wish we could go into our room, have our transition, come out and be like, I'm a new person, everything's fine. But a lot of times, our transition season is public. People know about it, whether it's a divorce. Maybe it's a bankruptcy. Maybe your kid is a knucklehead and doing the wrong thing. And because of social media, everybody knows about it. Maybe your business failed. Maybe you had to move houses or sell your house. You lost your home. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you had a breakup. Maybe your, your a transition is infertility. You're having a hard time having a baby. And that is, oh, that's public. People ask you and it's an open thing and, and, and it's awkward. It's an awkward transition to be in because you don't know what to say in the process. Maybe you're an empty nester now and you don't know what that looks like or how is that transition. And people see that. And it's, it's, a, it's a public transition that you're in. Listen, we are all in seasons of transition. And it makes us want to crawl in holes and not embrace the season. We want to hide from the transition. I was 34 years old. I had three children. I was living with my parents. This is not a dream life, guys. <laughs> as much as you may think, it was not a dream. It's not fun waking up to your parents, you know, having coffee in the morning with you and you going, I don't know if we have money to pay our bills today. It's a painful process. The problem is shame doesn't allow us to live wholeheartedly. We drag our feet in the process. We don't embrace the transition. We fight. 2 Timothy 2.15 says this, Study and do your best to present yourself to God approved, a workman who has no reason to be ashamed, accurately handling and skillfully teaching the words of truth. Here's the other thing I would have told Deborah sitting in that car. People are waiting for you on the other side of your obedience. This is not just about you. Your transition is not just about you. Your transition is about your children and your children's children and your legacy and other people who are watching you from a distance and seeing how you respond to your life. And so remember, there are people waiting for you. And it is not not just a private journey. 
And I would have said, Deborah, listen, had you known, I did not know that three years later I would be invited to be part of Jesus culture and I'd be one of the teaching pastors there and I would be, there would be a huge open door for me there. I did not know I was sitting in a car thinking that it was the end of my life, thinking that I had failed God, thinking that it was just going to be the end of everything. And yet God knew what was coming and he was waiting for my response and what it was supposed to look like. So how do we keep from being stuck in the transition, right? That they're in the wilderness 40 years instead of 11 days. How do we get, we get stuck, right, as people, mentally, emotionally, we get stuck in these, these cycles. How do we not get stuck? A couple things I'm going to leave you with, and it's this. The first thing is get rooted in community. You need to be rooted in your community. If you're here in church, that's great. You need to get rooted in that. You cannot do it on your own. We are not our own island, and unfortunately, in this American culture, we think we can do it all on our own. I'm growing on my own. I'm researching on my own. I'm pastoring myself. Guys, that is not biblical. That is not what God has for us. We are to be rooted and grounded in the word, for, to, to be in community with others in the body. And that is why you're here, so that we don't do it alone. We can look at each other and say, I got your back. I've got your back. You're not alone. I'm going to help you and walk with you through the process. Our pastor, Pastor Banning, wrote a book called Rooted. And he says, God is not interested in developing your vision or your promised land. He's interested in developing you. We need to be part of a loving community. We're not meant to walk alone. The second thing is, you can thrive in your wilderness. It's funny, when you garden, I'm not, is anybody here a gardener? Do you love to garden? Okay, a little bit. I don't have a garden yet. In fact, we are in a new, a new house, and so we have no backyard. It's just dirt at the moment. It's, we, it's weeds. But um, I have big desires of one day having a, a beautiful garden, and my grandpa was a gardener, my mom. And um, what I found, though, is, is that when you want a plant to grow, and you can confirm this, when you want something to grow, uh, you have to put manure on the soil. Is that Right. Right. So how many of you feel like there's been a little bit of manure on your soil? <laughs> right? Sometimes we have to go through the stinky stuff, the gross stuff, in order for us to flourish in the wilderness. So remember, if you have junk coming your way, whatever that is, just say, I'm growing. <laughs> God, I'm growing. You are giving me manure. I'm growing in it. And, uh, you, and don't tell people they're, you're, they're, you're, you know, that they're the manure. Please don't say that. Many times I've looked at my husband and been like, you are my manure. You stink, but I'm growing. Thank you, sweetheart. I'm growing in the process. <laughs> what I didn't know in the car was this, that God was going to take care of me and my beautiful children. It didn't matter if I got my milk from Wick or Whole Foods. They don't care. They're just getting milk, right? It didn't, I, I didn't realize that it was going to build my, a strong marriage, that he was actually getting to some deep roots in my own heart of trust, and faith and obedience with my spouse. And I didn't realize at the time that he was building our story of trust with each other in a new season. And now you know what happens when he says, honey, I don't know if we should do, I'm like, great, what do we do then? What do we need to do? Tell me. I'm there. I'm ready. I listen to him. I mean, we, I grew up, my dad is very intense Italian, as many of you know. He's very intense. And so for us to get our point across, we become very aggressive. We are like, no, no, no. You know, we, we kind of do it like as if we're lawyers. Like you prove your case. If you want something, these are the six reasons why, and this is what we're going to do. Well, I have an English husband who says one thing in a very calm way, in a very low voice. And I would think that it wasn't, there was no conviction in it, right? Like if you don't, if you don't say it strongly, if you don't, if you don't fight it, then, then that doesn't mean that you really care about it. Well, what I've learned is, is that him being able to say it and state it in a normal voice, he still has conviction and he's still hearing God. So, so for some of you women in this room who your husbands might be a little bit more laid back or easygoing or a little bit less intense about things, they're still hearing God. And so submit to that. So I have found that he doesn't have to get strong with me for me now to go, okay, honey, what do you want to do? Let's do it. I'll obey. I don't care. And not obey like, in, you know, in a in a weird way, but in a way of saying, whatever, I know you hear God. He hears God. He knew what was happening, and I can trust him in that. What I didn't know in the car, that was that God was going to take care of my needs, that my faith was not my parents' faith, it was my faith, and he was building my faith, and that I could lose everything. I had lost everything. We had, gotten a, we had lost a, our house. 
through a series of events um, with the market. We had had our cars repossessed. We had lost everything eight years ago. And I realized you, when you lose everything, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> like, you can take it all. As long as I have my family and I have the Lord, I'm good to go. And when that fear is gone, then you can really live in faith. And you have this faith to believe for the impossible. So once you lose it, the fear goes away. You can lose everything but what's important. So some of you right now, you are sitting in that car. And there's been transition that you've been in, and you've been wondering, what do I do with this? You know, I have felt like I've been wandering. I felt like maybe I've looked at my past and wondered what decisions I've done wrong. Maybe I have, I have felt frustrated. I've wandered in the desert with self-pity or fear or anxiety. I have not wandered in joy. I've been frustrated. I've blamed people. I've blamed my boss. I've blamed my, my, my spouse. I've blamed my parents. I've blamed my foundation. Whatever it is, I've blamed people around me, and I have not embraced what God has. And I want to say today that it's time to make a change. It's time to position yourself and trust in the transition that God knows what he's doing. And if you can trust in that transition, your perspective is going to change. And that wall that you feel is really, it's a smoke and mirror, guys. It's not real. That if you can begin to position yourself to trust the Lord in a new way, he's going to begin to move things on your behalf. And you're going to see major things happen. I'm going to have you all stand with me. We're going to pray together. Thank you, Jesus. You can someone come to the, the keyboard. Thank you, Jesus. You can just close your eyes with me for a moment. Lord, I thank you, God, that we can trust you in whatever season that we're in. That, Lord, we don't have to worry or fear that you're going to make it all okay, God. It may not look the way we want it to look, but that's okay, Lord. You're going to do it. And I'm going to ask if there's anyone in this room as I was talking and going through just the transition in my own life of some of the things that I've had to go through. If there's anyone in this room has has felt that way, has felt like they're in transition, I just just raise your hand. If you have felt like you're in transition and you don't fully know why things have happened the way they have, I believe the Lord wants to speak to you today. And he wants to put a word of hope in your heart that he knows what you're going through. And that you can trust him in the process. I'm going to ask if there's anyone in this room who felt like that they have fantasized of the past. That they have felt like if they would have made a different decision or if something, they would have done something differently, then their life would have looked different. If that's you, just raise your hand. You can raise it and put it back down. Okay. There's a lot of you in this room. How many of you have compared your journey to somebody else's? Just raise your hand and put it down. If you have compared your journey to somebody else's and it has tripped you up and it has caused you to feel like you are either second best or you were second choice or you didn't get what you needed. How many of you have felt that you have had shame in your journey? Has anybody in this room felt like you've had shame in your journey? Lots of you in this room. It's amazing what the enemy does to us. He silences us. How many of you have felt like you are wanting to just see something new and fresh happen in your life in this season? I'm going to ask all of you who raised your hand and all those to just lift your hands up. We're going to pray together. I want you to repeat after me, Jesus, would you help me to trust you in the transition, to believe that your ways are good that you've not forgotten about me, that I am not second best, that I am not forgotten, that I am not overlooked. I come against shame and fear and anxiety and fantasy of what I thought it would be. But I trust you that the end is gonna be better than the beginning and that you have good things for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand.